Joining us right now on the Squawk Newsline is Ken Langone. He is the chairman of Invamet Associates, uh, one of the co-founders of Home Depot. He is also, of course, at uh, NYU Langone Health Center, has been very much on the front lines there. And Ken, you called me on Friday because you were upset about the stories that aren't being told right now. What are, what are you seeing on the front lines right now? On the front lines, good morning, good morning, Becky. I'm sorry, Joe and Andrew. Uh, on the front lines, you can't believe the heroism, the effort, the enormous effort being made. The doctors, nurses, by the way, the pharmaceutical industry, which has been everybody's whipping boy lately over the last few years, is coming through like gangbusters for us. The stories I can tell you about right from the tops of these companies, like Triple M, like Abbott Labs, like Covidian, I'm sorry, like Baxter Labs, like uh, Covidian, yes, through, through Medtronic. All these companies that are pouring out, Danaher, we're all saying one thing about tests. We're saying we need to get tests. We need to get tests. It's very important. On March 4th, Robert Ford, the new CEO of Abbott, was in a meeting in Washington and realized that testing was going to be a very vital factor because they were getting a briefing. He went back, and within less than a month, Abbott had come up with these tests, which could be a godsend for all of us, because the faster we can get everybody tested. The point I'm making is I'm seeing heroism. Or I'm seeing generosity. I have lists of names of companies that are sending food to the hospitals, to the workers there. Krispy Kreme, I'm giving you names of Krispy Kreme, Sweet Green, Great Performances, Donut Pub, Wendy's. Nelson Peltz is sending 1,000 meals a week to each of the hospitals in New York and down here in Florida. The effort that's being made is magnificent. It should make you feel so good and so proud to be an American. These are stories that should be written. Instead, instead, the New York Times, in a headline normally reserved for something like a war or a, a crash of, a, uh, of, a, of a, uh, uh, an astronaut, it's terrifying. Millions more out of work. No kidding. We didn't know that. Of course we knew it. We're all worried. We're all frightened. We're all concerned about what the future holds. But the best thing we have going for us right now are, is everybody, the truck drivers that are bringing food from the factories, from the farms. Mayor de Blasio said there was going to be rationing of food. There is no rationing of food. Everybody's doing their part. The best thing that can happen, the best thing that all of us can do, stay home. Listen to the rules. Obey them. Respect them. The sooner we all comply, the quicker this thing is. All you hear from the smartest people, Dr. Fauci, Dr. Brooks, all those people, what are they all saying? Stay home. Comply. The sooner you do it, we're going to get to where we have to be. We will, sur we will survive this. We will pay a price for what we're going through, but it's a price we'll be able to afford. The point is, let's talk about the positives. I'm tired, I'm tired of the media having a feeding frenzy here. And by the way, I tell you, when, when, the, when all the postmortems are done, when all the postmortems are done, the media, in my opinion, is going to get a big fat F. It's done nothing. It's done nothing but incite differences. At a point in time when the house is on fire, they're out there putting gas on it because it's fun, or whatever they think it is. Right now, we need unity like never before, and we're getting it. We're getting it done. The doctors, the nurses, the truck drivers. I can go on and on, and the bus drivers. Things are happening. People are making sacrifices for the benefit of all of us. The least we can do is do our part. Our part as citizens should be stay home, obey separation, all the things they want you to do. It, it is working. It is working. Well, who's not doing their part, in my opinion? The media, both sides. Stop. Stop right now. Tell the American people Ken. warm stories, a wonderful story. Yesterday morning at 1 o'clock, Easter morning, 1 o'clock in the morning, a big fat sea turtle climbed up from the sea, dug a huge hole right here in the back of my home, dug a huge hole and dumped all of her eggs, and then went back and put the sand back on it and went back out to sea. Life is going on. Life will go on. Our lives, will re our lives as we knew them may take some time to get back to it, but don't short America. We're doing a great job, all of us, with one exception. Ken, in my I, opinion. I, Ken, I, I need to push. You. I watched, Ken, I I need watched to push. Andrew and Joe right now going back and forth at each other. Stop. You're going to have plenty of time to argue Ken, who was right and who was wrong. Yes, Andrew. Ken, 
can we, we, we can argue all of these points, and Joe and I are going back and forth on this, and I'm, I'm not trying to start a fight with anybody, but the critique of the media, um, I, I want to push back on only because I don't, I don't see it. Frankly, had the media been allowed to do its job in China, which is a place that doesn't allow the media to do its job, uh, in January, we might not have this problem because the media's job is to blow the whistle. That's the job of the media. So when you read articles that, that talk about what was going on inside the administration or not going on inside the administration or warning people about the possibilities of these things and then the government not taking the right steps or taking the right steps, that's the job of the media. That's what the, that's what the media is supposed to do. Uh, Andrew, the media is not supposed Andrew, to tell you warm and happy stories every day. Andrew, I'm sorry, Andrew. You're doing what the media does. Never admit they might have made a mistake. I have had two interviews with the media. And by the way, I've got a new policy, Andrew. I tape record all the interviews I give to the reporters. And when you play them back, it is disgusting. I'm sorry. There's plenty of time for the media. Say all you want about things that can help us get through this crisis right now. There's going to be plenty of time. There's going to be plenty of time for a vote. And that's going to happen. The final judge is going to be November when the American people elect the president. They'll decide who did what. Right. I'm sorry, Andrew. The media presents itself and, as and never being wrong. Joe, I never. Mean, uh, uh, Ken, the, the, media, the media makes mistakes. I make mistakes. We all make mistakes. But I'll also say this. You're, we are going to have a vote in November, and that's true. But if you don't have a thriving media that can provide real information factual information of the public and not information that's being skewed left and right. And I agree, by the way, it's not always skewed the way you want it to be. But without it, you don't have a functioning democracy and you see what happens in countries where it doesn't exist. Look, Andrew, let me make a concession. Democracy dictates and needs a vibrant, objective media. I'll give you, for instance, I'll give you, for instance, last week I get a call from a reporter. I've got this on tape, by the way. By the way, I now announce I'm happy to answer your questions, but it's going to be on tape. They let me go ahead and do it. His question was to me, I'm trying to get this drug, hydrochloric one, I think it is, because we're going to do a clinical at NYU. He wanted to know if I called the White House for the drug. Or if I'd called that, I said, no, I called one of our directors, one of our trustees, Roberto Mignoni. He's on the board of Teva. All we wanted was a supply of the drugs to conduct our clinicals. He was hell-bent on tying my trying to get this drug for a scientific purpose to whether I call the White House. When we get over this, I'm going to bring the tape in, Andrew, and you can listen to this interview. It was disgusting. I'm sorry. It was dis Andrew, I have no problem with your belief and my belief that we need a vibrant free media. But I'm sorry, the fire that's being raging in this country right now, in my opinion, and I, by the way, a lot of the people agree with me, Andrew, like it or not. You know, Andrew, ask yourself this question. Why is the media held in such low regard by the American people? That's something that ought to concern you. Because, God forbid, when we lose faith in the media, we really have a problem for democracy. I agree with that. Anyway, we look. did hear over the weekend. We, we did hear over the weekend, Ken, that um, intubations and admissions into New York hospitals were declining. What, what yes, are you seeing are. on that front at NYU Langone? It, we are seeing the same thing. It's early. It's too early to make a projection, but the numbers are very encouraging. They're very encouraging, and and as long as we continue to do what we're at, every single American could be a foot soldier in this fight. Every single one of us. All we have to do is comply, stay home, stay separate. Please, we're going to have plenty of time to be together again, plenty of time. And we're going to, we're going to cherish that, that, that time when we are together. That does get us to the question about when that time is coming, because that's where business leaders are starting to turn. That's where people who have been home are starting to turn, is when can we get to the other side of this? You, you said earlier that we should be listening to Dr. Burks, Dr. Fauci. What, what, what's your best guess about when we might actually be able to get to the other side? Becky, I think for me to make a guess would be absolutely uh, reckless on my part. I can say this to you. Mm -hmm. If we stay on what these numbers indicate right now, 
I think we have a good chance of being out sooner rather than later. I have my wish. I have my hope. It's going to depend upon how we go, go back to a normal life. Do we do it in phases? Do we do it by geography? These are all questions that need to be answered, and I have enormous faith in the scientists and doctors all over. Becky, I want to tell you one more little story about the pharma. Saturday night at 5 o'clock, I got a call from our people that we were running dangerously low of filters for, for dialysis. I called Robert Kraft, mm-hmm. who gave us 300,000 masks for New York City, by the way, sent us plane to China. Ask him if he knew Joe Almeida. I needed to reach Joe. I knew Joe, but I didn't know where to find him. Within 30 minutes, Joe, Robert had Joe and me on the phone. By 8 o'clock that night, we were, we were comfortable that we were going to have the filters we need to keep dialyzing people. This is what's going on. Big companies. Uh, uh, Tom Joyce of Data, Eli Lilly, David Ricks starts a line to, to do tests to people. Tests, by the way, that Lilly developed in their own lab that work. They can't be mass-produced so that the people of Indianapolis know who's at risk and who's not. The same is true. I, Alex Gorsky. Alex Gorsky has turned his entire research effort, go find a vaccine. That's the ultimate answer. So, Becky, what I'm saying, back to your question, I can't give you an educated guess. I'm praying that sooner rather than later, I'm optimistic that we're gaining on it big time, but I think I'll know better. we'll all know better a week from now. My guess is we may be at the peak right now or near it. But the important thing, the important thing is the work that's been, the entire pharmaceutical industry and healthcare industry is focused on this problem. God bless. The, na- the hey, can, pharmaceutical can, industry and the healthcare industry is truly a national treasure. Stop. And I plead guilty. I'm a major investor in the industry. Stop beating up on it. If we get out of this thing, it's going to be largely in good part to what they're able to do to help us, together with health care providers, to head, together with the truck drivers. and the bus. God bless America. We're at our best right now, and we ought to take hey, Ken, a step back. Ken, yes, sir. Yes. Ken, we, so yes. The, first, the first U.S. death, first U.S. death was February 29th in, in, right. in the United States. We're trying to figure out, I mean, an economy is important and, and it's shut down and that there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of really negative consequences to that, too. So it would have right. been tough, obviously, to shut the entire country down on one death on February 29th. But how do we reopen? When, what, what is an acceptable amount of risk? Because you, you obviously, you know, we're hearing shut down for 18 months. From certain people, I don't know what the economic effects uh, and would be for, or and the societal effects of being shut down for a year or whatever. But we're going to have the same type of arguments and the same type of second guessing when we reopen. If God forbid another person dies afterwards, how, how do we walk the fine line between trying to get an economy restarted and not opening yourselves up to criticism? that you were heartless or, or caused right. death or have blood on your hands? Because you're going to hear it from the media, as you can see from, from what we've been talking about today. Let me, let me say this. When the, when the providers of health care can manage the caseload and do everything else it does, we'll be there. And we're going to get there. We're going to get there, Joe. Now, I have no doubt we're going to get there. The point is we had a surge. We had a, we were te- By the way, here's an example. Thank God we have the Javits Center. Thank God we have that boat. Why? Because, God forbid, if we had a need for it, it would have been better to have it and not use it than not have it and need it. This is an example of where people are arguing back and forth. Uh, they, they overreacted. They shouldn't have done it. They did. Do. The fact of the matter is I'm taking the position, God bless it, if we had an overload of people, we had a place to put them, not on the street. So, Joe, my, I'm giving you a long-winded answer. What I'm saying is when we reach the point that we can manage whatever comes in, we're okay. We'll be able to deal with it. Thank God 99% of the people that get this virus are going to live. Thank God we're going to get through this. And, by the way, we're going to look – my guess – I will give you a guess, and this is a wild guess. My guess is the death toll in America – will be less than 50,000, and I pray to God I'm right. This was only five days ago they were talking about 100 to 240,000. I think part of what's happening 
part of what's happening is happening because of the way we're responding. I have no trouble doing an autopsy on who didn't do what, or when we should have done it. There's going to be plenty of time for that, but not now. Look at these people on your, on your screen. They're showing of what's going on. How about the firemen and the cops getting in front of our place last week with their sirens and their lights, praising and cheering on our workers who were back in that hospital taking care of people? Joe, uh, look, there's a fine balance here. To me, the worst thing would be if it turned loose and we went right back to where we were. That would be tragic. That would be a monumental uh, problem. Right now, I think if we listen to the doctors, if we listen to the science, if we look at the data, I think we're going to be able to ease back in. And, Becky, you asked me a question. My guess is I'm hoping that within 30 days from now, by the middle of May, we'll start to see normalcy returning. Not to the way it was before because we've got issues. How do we, how do we open up restaurants and make sure there's some space between tables? That affects the economics of the restaurant how much rent you pay and proceed. Mm. You're going to have fewer seats. These are all things that have to, but I can tell you right now, the greatest thing we have going for us is the spirit of this great nation and the people in this nation that are the heroes. And we can all be a hero if we comply. So, Joe, I'm, I'm ducking the question about when and if should we have done this, should we have done, yeah, you're right, Joe. We were all at Jack Walsh's funeral at St. Pat's. Hell, I was hugging everybody. It's my nature. It was a wonderful event. It was a celebration of a life well led. Look at what Jack accomplished. Look at what he did. I'm glad we were all there because he deserved to go out in that form. So uh, that's. Hey, Ken, let look, me, go ahead, Becca. What, l let me just ask you, you you talked about some of the cooperation and uh, enormous cooperation you've been getting for companies, including 3M. Uh, 3M's mm -hmm. been the target of a lot of ire from the media and from the administration, too. Mm -hmm. But wh why don't you talk about how you've worked with them and what they've done? Well, the first thing I want to assure everybody is the, the participation by 3M in this effort has been nothing, more, nothing short of spectacular. Right up to Mike Roman, the CEO, there was a glitch there for a period of time. The problem was there were, the market was being flooded with offerings of masks that were either non-existent or, or were knockoffs. They were, they were imposters, so to speak. You can't believe how much Triple M helped us, our supply chain people, when we called them and we said we have an offer for 50,000 masks from here, and they would come back and say, yeah, they're okay, or no, don't buy them. They're a problem. We know of one hospital that bought a massive amount of, of, of masks, and they turned out to be not usable. Because Now, Triple M has been, in my opinion, spectacular, all the way to the top of the company. There's a young man by the name of Mike Delvecchio. He, he, he was the guy I interfaced with, and, and he was helpful. But, and by the way, nobody's gotten favoritism. I didn't get one extra mask because I plugged into Triple M. How did I get to Triple M? I called up Jim McNerney, who was a former chairman of Triple M years ago before he went to Boeing. He made an introduction, and through that introduction, I was able to get in. Just like Saturday night, we needed filters for dialysis, which are made by Baxter. Robert Ford to Joe Almeida to me. The same is true with we needed t test kits from, uh, from Cephid. I, I touch base with I, I get Larry Culp, who used to run down to her. He calls up Tom Joyce. Tom Joyce on Saturday morning calls me. The point is everybody's getting the benefit of all of our efforts. NYU is not getting extra special favorable treatment. The point is, the point I want to make is the effort that's being put out Alex Gorsky tells all of the scientists there's one thing we need right now, a vaccine, go to work. David Ricks, there's a lot of promise this morning. There was something on, on your show this morning about Lily working on a, on a product. These companies collectively and separately are doing a spectacular job, and I'll say it again. It is truly a jewel of our society that we have a vibrant, healthy pharmaceutical industry and healthcare industry. And the hospitals, by the way, and by Again. the way, all five major teaching hospitals in New York, the cooperation that's going on with us is magnificent. Magnificent. We're all working together. Hey, hey, hey Ken, I, I want to second what you just said about the first line, uh, f f first line people on the first, uh, first line who are doing all the good work at your hospital and others. I also want to say, even though we debate, uh, 
Uh, I like you a lot, and, and I, I, I hope we still have a, as good a relationship as we always have. And that's why I want to ask you a, a personal question, yeah. um, which is this. There's a lot of people in the business community who are saying, let's get back to work. Um, I think you would like to see us all get back to work. We all would like to see us get back to work. Uh, you are a vivacious uh, 84 years young. So my question to you is, what is it going to take for you to go out of the house? And what, what would it take for you to get on a subway in New York City? Because that's the question that so many people are going to be grappling with. <laughs> Let me plead guilty. I haven't been on a subway in 25 years. No, I take it back. When the Pope was in New York, the quickest way to get from St. Patrick's Cathedral to uh, Madison Square Garden, Larry Bossidy and Nancy Bossidy and Elena and I took the subway. Look, what's it going to take for me? A mask? A mask? Uh, Precautions? Keep some degree of separation between me and the other person on the subway? Look, uh, right now I can guarantee you one thing. We are going to go through substantial, substantial behavioral change. For a period of time. I don't know if I Look, once we get a vaccine, once we get a big enough basis of testing people, we're going to be fine. We're going to be fine. I don't know if we'll go back to the way we were. Frankly, I'd kind of like it if I went into a restaurant and I had a little bit more room because I'm a big, hulky guy and I move all over and my chair's moving around all the time. And frequently I'll bump somebody who sits in back of me. So there's some good that's going to come out of it for me. Look, by the way, thanks. By the way, Andrew, understand something? You and I have spirited debates. I have a lot of respect for you, and I like you. And I, I, I respect you for a lot of things, not the least of which is every once in a while you can see it. Maybe you're wrong. I wish more of the media did that because that's part of the problem with the media. They back themselves into a position, and when they write a correction, they put it next to the obituary section of the newspaper when they made a mistake. Look, we'll have plenty of time, you and me, to argue about the media. I will tell you this, Andrew. There's one number you can't argue with, the low regard the American people have for the media. The media ought to ask themselves the question, are we at risk of not doing our job because people don't believe us or don't trust us or don't like us? That's a fact. You know the number. I know the number. That's, that's frightening. We need to get that number up. We all need to believe in the media more. We all need to have more respect for the Ken, media. Unfortun- they do do a great job. Ken, unfortunately, though, unfortunately, this administration and, and this president uh, derides the media regularly, calls it fake news, and often lies about the actual facts. I'm not saying the media is not wrong. The media makes mistakes. I make mistakes. All, I, I, I concede that up front. But, but I think that over the past two years uh, or three years now, things have gotten worse in large part because we've had an administration that has gone after the media in, in a way that I, I, I think has not always been truthful. I'm sorry to say. Andrew, I, I made it an effort this morning in this interview to stay away from taking sides, okay? I said earlier, there's plenty of grain blame to go around. I'm not naming names. I don't want to do that. It's not constructive. And it's not keeping with the spirit of why I'm on here this morning, okay? Not at all. Andrew, let me say this to you. There's going to be plenty of times for arguing. But I have my own experiences, as I said, Andrew, and I want you to listen to this tape of this interview of this man trying to say, I called the White House, the inference was, that I was supporting the president's point of view on the drug. I wanted the drug to end the argument. I wanted the drug so we could do a clinical trial and say, hey, it doesn't work or it does work. And here, that's how you do it. That's a solid scientific basis for making, that's how major drugs get approved. Clinical trials, these are rigorous trials, these are broad, these are very expensive. We saw an opportunity because so many people with a disease, hey, we've got people we can enroll and we'll be able to have a double blind study and we'll be able to know whether or not yes it helped or no it didn't. Right now, two kids in the schoolyard spitting at each other. Stop it. (laughs) Yeah, amen to that. Hey, Ken, I want to appreciate, we appreciate your time coming on here today talking about what you're seeing, particularly at NYU Langone. It's great to hear that we could be facing a peak this week, and we hope you'll come back and tell us more about what you see as this week uh, progresses. Thank you for Becky, your time. I it's want to say hear. something else, please, quickly. I want to say the other hospitals sure. are doing just like we are. This is a community effort involving everybody. We're doing great, thank God. All of us, all the hospitals, all the workers. Thanks for having me. Have a nice day. Thank you.